Coming up on this episode, the Warriors' defense continues to find its best form of the season, holding an opponent under 100 points for the third straight game. This time, a 115-97 victory over the Charlotte Hornets. I have all the takeaways from that, including a particular focus on the Golden State front court. Yes, welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast after the Warriors defeated the Hornets in Charlotte, 115-97 on Friday or Saturday afternoon it now is. For me here in Australia, uh, Warriors 39-34 on the season, still 10th in the Western Conference, but since last time I spoke, three straight wins. Really impressive back-to-back victories over the Miami Heat and Orlando Magic, and then again today. When what was a bit of a bit of a battle in the first half, obviously neither team really getting it to go offensively, uh, but the Warriors came out in the third quarter and kind of punched Charlotte in the face. I think Brandon Miller hit that jump up, first possession of the third quarter, cut it to three. And then from there, the Warriors went on a 21-7 run, got out to a double-digit lead, and Charlotte never really threatened from there. So nice to have a a comfortable second half, a comfortable final seven, eight minutes of the game where the the win was pretty much locked up. Uh, But defensively, this is clearly now the best stretch of the Warriors season. This is three straight games uh, holding an opponent under 100 points, which I went back because I thought, oh, you know, I doubt the Warriors have done that this season. I highly doubt the Warriors have done that this season. I went back through the first, what today was the 73rd game, so the first 70 games or whatever. Uh, The Warriors hadn't done it twice in a row all season. Had not held an opponent under 100 points twice in a row all season. And so to do it three times now, yes, against three teams, who can struggle a bit offensively. Like Orlando are a a really good team, but more so a defensive-minded team right now who are really propped up offensively by Paolo and Franz, and both those guys, particularly Paolo, struggled in that game earlier in the week. And then the Heat as well, uh, they're more of a defensive-minded unit. They were without Tyler Hero. uh, They were without uh, Jimmy Butler, obviously, their, their star player. So... I think there is a little bit of this where you've got to look at it from a fan perspective and think, are the Warriors really, really an elite defensive team or have they just come up against three teams in a row now who aren't great offensively, at the, even at the best of times, and are also missing, you know, in the in the case of Miami and in the case of Charlotte today, missing, you know, LaMelo Ball primarily. You're missing some star-level talent offensively, which is going to help what you're doing defensively. There's no doubt about that. So, yes, there's an element here of the Warriors getting slightly lucky in who they've played in three consecutive games to achieve this feat of keeping an opponent under 100 points. However, you still just got to go out and do the job against who you're coming up against. And the defense right now looks really good. And I still think, you know, the fact that they're in the best in this form, I think it's still the best form defensively, the best they've looked defensively all season. And so the real question for me now is with Jonathan Kaminga having missed the last two games and Trace Jackson Davis starting instead of him, Steve alluded to it post-game. He loves the combination of Draymond and TJD at the 4-5. Is that now going to be a question mark for the starting lineup moving forward? And that's probably the biggest thing that's emanated for me from this game because once again Warriors look great defensively they look great defensively with TJ, with TJD at the 5 against the uh, against the Magic earlier in the week is this something they're going to have to go to now on a more permanent basis and it's it's a hard one it's really a hard one because yes they look so much better defensively but also you're not all of a sudden going to take JK out of the starting lineup surely when he's fit and healthy given he's been their second-best scorer for the large majority of the last few months, given the rise that he's had as a player, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to prioritise the team and the defensive capacity that TJD brings you? Or are you going to, you know, the offensive end of the floor, are you going to prioritise that? And I think that's why Clay moved back into the starting lineup uh, as well, is because without JK, you obviously need that offensive threat that Clay gives you. And that's going to be a question mark moving forward as well, because after Clay did uh, get reinserted into the starting lineup, you know, Steve came out and said this is not going to be a permanent decision. So 
I think this is the biggest issue for the Warriors for the whole season is we're still at you know 73 games in and we're not particularly sure what the best starting five is. I'm not sure. I don't think Steve's sure. All you know is it's probably, well, it's definitely Steph, clearly. Uh, and then it's probably Draymond. But even then, like, is, are we going to reach a scenario? I don't think it's going to be this season, but it's probably going to be next season or, or some point uh, along Draymond's contract where he's no longer the starting power forward. And maybe it's the JK-TJD combination. But until then, what's it going to be? Is it going to be JK-Draymond 4-5? Is it going to be JK, T, uh, sorry, Dream on TJD 4-5? What's it going to be? Because right now, the way Andrew Wiggins is playing, you're not taking him from the starting small forward spot. I think if you have JK at the 3, Dream on at the 4, TJD at the 5, that interests me. That definitely interests me, but I just think that's way too little three-point shooting. You'd ha- certainly have to have Stefan Clay in your backcourt for that to happen. But the way that the Warriors are playing defensively, the, the fact that Steve has alluded to the, the fact that he likes uh, both Draymond and TJD out there together. The fact that, you know, the back soreness or the back issues for Draymond, you know, started to emanate and flare up a little bit on the back of having to carry such a burden and such a load playing prim- primarily as a centre. The other thing I want to say as well with this whole scenario is that over the last couple of games, Kevon Looney's actually been okay. Like, I actually like the minutes that Loon has given over the last couple of games. And that's not... Uh, it's, we're not going to assume that he's all of a sudden going to come straight back into the rotation once JK's back. I think that's just really been a factor of that is, is you've got to have another front court player out there so Loon's got some opportunity. But you know he's going to be ready to go at any second, don't you? So uh, is that if you've got to play Draymond and TJD together, does that give Loon some opportunity in the second unit, even if it's four or five minutes each half? Who knows? Like these are all the questions and the issues that the you know Steve and, and Golden State have faced all season. Like you just do not know who your top five is. Like who's the best starting five that you have, and and I think that's that's the biggest issue because I wrote an article about it the other day. If you look at the top teams in the league, the top lineups, they all have an absolute set starting five. If you look at the the starting fives for the top teams in the West, the top three teams, Denver. Of course, we know, like, Jamal Murray, KCP, MPJ, Aaron Gordon, Nikola Jokic won a championship last season, running it back with that same starting five, went healthy this season, and that is not going to change at any point, right? Even OKC, a really young team, and when you've got a young team, you think, yeah, that like that starting five might shift a little bit. No, like, they know who they have. They've got Shea, they've got Josh Giddy, they've got Jalen Williams, they've got Lou Dort, they've got Chet. That's their five, and that's what they've been going to all season. Uh, same with Minnesota. If you look at them with where well, they got Conley, Edwards, McDaniels, a cat and Gobert when healthy, like that is their starting five. They know who they are. And the Warriors, unfortunately this season just haven't quite been able to know who they are. And that has somewhat been, you know, yes, there's been some elements of unavailability and Draymond getting, getting himself suspended at the start of the season has really hurt that. Uh, but you would have thought by now, 73 games in, they kind of would know who they are uh, and what they want to be and have a set starting five, and it's just not the case. It's not the case because we don't know what's happening with the shooting guard spot, and we don't know what's happening with the front court. Right now, Wiggs is the one that's you know definitely locked in. Uh, Draymond, you would think, is locked in, although yeah, I'm going to talk about him later with his ejection, obviously, the other day against Orlando. JK, you would have assumed, would be locked in given his development, but then he has this knee soreness and TJD comes in. And I don't know, it's just, it's it's a bit of a mess. It's always kind of a nice mess to have when you've got options. I get that. Um, the flexibility is there, which is good. But still, 73 games in, you would like to know who your starting five is. But uh, offensively, in, this one, in fact, just to close on def- on the defensive aspect, so the Hornets were kept to less than 41% shooting from the floor, 26% from three-point range. Obviously, they're not a great offensive team as it is, uh, but they are capable, like the fact that Miles Bridges wasn't overly efficient today. Uh, Brandon Miller was never able to get going, had some injury issues there in the second half. So they're capable. They beat the Cavs the other day. Uh, you know They are an NBA team after all. They've got some talent out there, but the Warriors did a good job just to completely minimize their uh, their scoring output. Offensively for the Warriors, really balanced scoring display. Steph led the way, 23 points, 9 of 18 shooting. Wiggs again, I think. This is, I don't, I don't want to go too early on it because it's only really been three games. Uh, but this is 
certainly Wig's best three game period, I think, of the season. Like he's had better games where I think he might have had one or two thirty point games or close to thirty point games kind of thing, but usually he follows that with a disappointing one. It's really about the consistency for Wiggs. He's just been so inconsistent this season. And now we've got three really good games from him in a row where he goes 20 points today. I think he was 7 of 17, so he wasn't overly efficient necessarily. But it was just what he was doing overall uh, in terms of the rest of his game with eight rebounds, eight assists, which I haven't checked. That has to be a season high, easily a season high, surely. Eight, Eight assists for Andrew Wiggins. I don't think he would have had has he had six in a game this season before that? I don't know. But anyway, uh, two steals and a block as well. Played uh, nearly 35 minutes. So you can see, especially with JK out, he's obviously even more important. Uh, but to have that display after coming off the fourth quarter against the Magic, where you know, even Steph came out post game and, and said, you know, Wiggs won that game for us in Orlando. You know, Warriors had a, a big lead early, obviously kept Orlando to 11 points in the first quarter. Uh, had the lead from there on. But Orlando really, really came hard at the Warriors in that fourth quarter, and it was Wiggs who was really able to step up and you know do what he does best when he's playing well is that, yes, he can be a catch-and-shoot option, but he can also be a guy that you can give the ball to and you can get his own bucket. That's what he was for the Warriors in the 2021-22 season where he was an all-star, and that's what he did in the playoffs. When he was the second-best player on a championship team, he is still capable of being that isolation scorer that the Warriors need at times uh, You know when, off, when their offense isn't quite running uh, as efficiently as they might like or if they're late in the shot clock kind of thing. So, uh, you know, big fourth quarter from Wiggs against the Magic and fantastic to see him uh, have another really productive performance today. And I think he's having a two-way impact. He's obviously being able to be that perimeter defender the Warriors need to be able to stem uh, opposing offenses. And he's obviously playing a big part in in achieving that that three-game feat of keeping teams under 100 points. So, Wiggs is playing really well at the moment. Uh, I don't. I feel like you know saying this is kind of putting the mockers on him a little bit, and I fully expect him to come out against the Spurs in a couple of days and just put up a stinker because I feel like that's how his season's rolling. I feel like this is how the Warriors' season's rolling is whenever we think you know they're really back or Wiggs is really back and and back at you know and we're not saying two, 2022 form, but somewhere closer to that rather than what he was at the start of the season, then. You know, usually he might throw out a disappointing game where you're just like, oh, really? I should have, I should have known better, kind of thing. And that's the thing. I just, I'm saying all this, and I just, I just want to see it more consistently. I need to see it for more than three games. And if you look at some of the stats they showed up on the broadcast today, is that over the last 25 games he's shooting 40 percent from three or something like that. So, I mean, he has been like, no doubt, he has been much better over you know the last you know since just before the all-star break or this year even if you go back to the start of January so uh it's going to be interesting to see what happens with him over the the remainder of the season because for him and for some other guys like you could be potentially looking at this as a a career defining final even if the Warriors don't make the playoffs like is it a career defining last 10 to 12 games for Andrew Wiggins in terms of his future at the Golden State Warriors with some decisions to be made in the off season, even though he's contracted for another three seasons beyond this one. Uh, I've spoken about the the kind of question marks with Draymond and, and TJD. TJD, 18 points, eight rebounds today, had an assist, had two steals, three blocks. I don't know, the Warriors just do look a lot different with a shot clocking presence in there. And as good as Draymond was kind of in his prime as a legitimate shot blocker, and that's why I still think Draymond's the best defender of the past decade, is his ability to switch out onto the perimeter. And be and also be a legitimate shot blocking presence in the paint was what made him you know absolutely unbelievable like the most versatile defender I think we've potentially seen here in the last decade and and the best defender we've seen in the last decade and while I'd always take Draymond over Rudy Gobert but you know athletically at this point thirty four years of age he isn't quite that player uh, and I think he certainly benefits from having. Another big body alongside of him, and particularly one who can be the shot blocking presence that TJD is, as opposed to a Kavon Looney, who's more of a, a positioning defender and, and high IQ guy kind of thing. So TJD has been fantastic, and at some point here, I mean, again, even if he's not starting, he's going to have to play 25 plus minutes. He played another 30, 31 today. It was absolutely outstanding. Padded his rebounding stats a little bit with a couple of misses on the way to the basket, but. His like j- jump off a miss is absolutely unbelievable. Like his ability 
to go up, miss the shot, and then just quickly follow it in, or quickly follow it in a couple of times. Uh, he's just got real unbelievable bounce that he's kind of, I don't know, you still see him kind of run up and down the floor and you're just like, is this guy really that athletic? Uh, and then he just has these explosive jumps kind of thing and it's like, yeah, he is. And so you see him you know, catching lobs from CP and that was something Steve also alluded to is having Chris and TJD together uh, is always a bonus. And that's probably why I think they will go back to TJD off the bench and uh, and Draymond back starting the 5, JK at the 4 to also give TJD those minutes with, with CP3, who was also good today. I think he had 11 points, 7 rebounds, 9 assists, 5 or 6 shooting from the floor. I have been a little bit concerned with CP the last couple of games. Like that first quarter today where he just had a couple of really needless turnovers, which were warrior-type turnovers, let's be honest. They were warrior-type turnovers. However, that's they're not Chris Paul-type turnovers. And, you know, Fitz even said on the broadcast, like, you haven't seen him do that for his whole 20-year career. He doesn't do those things. And there's been a couple of times, I think he had one in the Magic game and maybe one in the Heat game the, the day before, where he just got stripped at half court, like just bring the ball up, got stripped at half court and then gave up a layup on the other end. And it's like, like Chris Paul doesn't do this. What's going on? And so maybe it's just another sign of, you know, he's 38 years old. Maybe it's another sign of the aging kind of thing. Who knows? Uh, but otherwise, like he's still a pretty productive and winning player for the Warriors and he was again today. Uh, the other big aspect for Golden State was Moses Moody, who found his shooting stroke, 15 points, four rebounds, three assists, but four or five from three-point range. Uh, that's huge for the Warriors. And, you know, if you look at it outside of that, the Warriors uh, won the points in the paint battle, 64-38. So they've been you know, bashing some teams up here on the inside a little bit, and they kind of have to do that uh, because shout-out to Will Udy, a colleague of mine at Fansided, who... Went to the Warriors Hornets game today as a media member, and I woke up to a message from him this morning asking me if I would like to pass on a question to Steve Kerr. And so the biggest thing I wanted to know from Steve, because I've been kind of on this for a while, and those of that those of you that have listened to a few of the recent episodes or, or whatever would probably know this, but I've been on about the Warriors having a lack of three point shooting beyond Steph Curry and Clay Thompson just on this roster. Overall, and so that was the biggest thing as soon as Will sent me that message. I was like, I need to know what Steve thinks about this roster and the three-point shooting because just to give some context behind it, and this is what kind of uh, Will outlined to, to Steve as well before he actually asked the question. Uh, if you go back to the, the championship season 2021-22, the Warriors had four players that made over two threes per game. So that was obviously Steph, Clay, Wiggs, and JP. If you go back to last season, they had those four again, plus DiVincenzo. So they had five guys averaging over two threes made per game. And then if you have a look at this season, you've obviously got Steph and Clay. They're always going to average over two made threes until the season they re- until they retire, essentially. Uh, but if you look at who's who's third right now in average made threes for the Warriors, it's Chris Paul at one point four per game. So that's the context I kind of provide. You know, I'm providing here. I, I stated these things to Will to pass on. So he kind of gave those statistics to Steve, and then asked Steve if he's a bit concerned about the lack of three point shooting on this roster. And to be fair to Steve, like he answered it as you know I would expect him to answer it. That uh, you know he he's not going to flat out say no. I don't think there's enough three point shooting on this team. He just like looked specifically at, at Wiggs and Moody and saw those two guys as they are capable three-point shooters that have been down a little bit this season. And so uh, certainly a fantastic quote that I'll put into an article for tomorrow. Uh, But, you know, it does get me thinking that Moses, I think he's potentially a more important factor to the Warriors than what some may believe, where we see the entire season, his minutes have kind of fluctuated, his opportunity fluctuates uh, quite drastically, really. But if he's going to shoot the ball like this, like he did here against the Hornets, four or five from three-point range, if he's going to shoot it like that, then the Warriors need to use him. And the, well, like they need him flat out because they don't have enough three-point shooting on this roster. And as Steve alluded to in answering my question, like they they could do with Moses Moody. Like They think he's a capable three-point shooter who's been a little bit down recently and on the season with his three-point percentage. And so this is a huge outing for him to go four or five from three-point range. And Wiggs as well, who 
isn't necessarily shooting the ball, you know, fantastically well on a game by game basis necessarily. Like he can still have his his down games, but again, I think I saw on the broadcast he's forty plus percent from three over his last twenty five games. So uh, the Warriors definitely need those two guys to be shooting the ball well because otherwise, I don't think they have enough three point shooting beyond Steph and Clay. But uh, again, shout out to to Will for passing on my question to Steve. Uh, that was very much appreciated. Uh, the other thing I kind of wanted to get into, shorter episode today, uh, the dream on ejection the other day and just the emotional response that it elicited from Stephen Curry, which was bizarre is potentially the word, like strange. So Draymond obviously gets ejected less than four minutes into that magic game, uh, just going at the refs way too much, obviously. Uh, refs probably don't have as much patience with Draymond. Uh, as they do. In fact, it can go the other way sometimes. I know a lot of opposing fans think that Draymond gets away with more in terms of having a go at the referees and some other players do. So it can work both ways, I suppose. But clearly, the officials in that one uh, had little patience, threw him out, two techs, away you go, which a huge game. Uh, Rockets right on the, the coattails of the Warriors for the 10th. In fact, that game might have just finished between the Rockets and the Jazz. We'll give an update. Obviously, you guys listen to this after the afterwards, we already know, but uh, let's just double check. I'm assuming, I think they'll four up with a few minutes to go. Ah, uh, that's frustrating. <laughs> the Rockets win by one over the Jazz, 101 100, which means they remain within one game of the Warriors. That April 4 battle in a few days here in Houston is going to be huge. Just going to see what happens. Okay, so. Yeah, we essentially got two Jalen Green free throws to make it a four-point game with three seconds to go, and then Taylor Hendricks hit a three. So it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't overly close. It didn't come down to the final shot or whatever. Uh, yeah, so that's disappointing. Warriors still only one game ahead of the Rockets, who have now won eleven straight games. Uh, Warriors' next meeting is against the Spurs, and then they've got the Mavs. Then they've got the Rockets. Rocket, who are the Rockets playing? I think they've they've got a much tougher schedule up coming just checking uh, do they play to no they don't play tomorrow they play they play against the, the mavericks at home on sunday or monday my time and then they play the timberwolves in minnesota like that's a game you just expect the timberwolves to win but I don't know. Who knows? I was immensely frustrated with the Thunder rest. Well, I don't think the Sun Thunder necessarily rested Shea for that matchup uh, against against Houston because it looked like I don't think Shea played today against Phoenix either. But uh, just trying to give an update on kind of what's going on with the Warriors Rocket situation. Uh, however, back to the Draymond aspect. So Draymond gets ejected and Steph like crying, literally crying almost uh, because really like he just understands the perspective of the season right now like the Warriors clinging to a playing tournament spot like not even a playoff spot just the playing tournament 10th seed which even then they need to win two road games to make the playoffs and Draymond needlessly gets ejected less than four minutes into the game and so I've had a few people ask me I was like do you reckon this is the end for Draymond and there's been a lot of conversation about it which is kind of interesting because if you look back through Draymond's history like he's had plenty of moments where he's had go had a go at referees and got ejected like this isn't something new Steph would have seen this 15 20 times right Steph's seen much worse things you seen him have a crack KD you seen him punch Jordan Poole he saw the hit on Yusuf Nurkic earlier this season and even just before that the headlock on Rudy Gobert like we've seen all this stuff a lot of stuff that is so much more significant than having a go at the referees, getting two texts and getting ejected. And yet this was, from a Steph response standpoint, this was like the most emotional he might have he might have gotten. And he was just so disappointed that his veteran teammate, who he's rode through thick and thin with, is doing something so needless so early in the game in a pivotal matchup. And Draymond is really, really fortunate the Warriors were able to carry him and him being off the floor into winning that game against the lander. Because if that was a loss, particularly a close loss, I can imagine that everyone 
everyone would be even more frustrated with Draymond than what they already were, even though, you know, it was a win. So uh, is this, you know, I've seen some conversations, I think 95.7 the game kind of spoke about it earlier in the day uh, about, you know, is this the end for Draymond? Because throughout it all, like he has a go at KD, he hits JP, whatever else. He's never necessarily impacted Stephen Curry so specifically as he did in that game where Steph was quite emotional. Steph was quite emotional the whole night, both ways. Like he had, you know, the, the, the Draymond disappointment, he was almost had tears from. And then he hits that, you know, dagger step back three, does the night night celebration to the Orlando crowd, then goes over in the timeout and stomps on a chair. Like just stomps a chair on a chair after doing something good, not even in frustration at something negative. <laughs> like he won, the, that was the dagger that won them the game. And he's still stomping on chairs. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a weird one. I, I just think, I know people are trying to kind of look at this as, you know, Draymond's, this was a clear indication that Draymond's really affecting and really impacting Steph. And Steph's the last one, right? Like, I feel like there's been mul- a multitude of times where the Warriors could have moved on from Draymond Green. And Steph's the guy like, no, like, we need to keep this guy. I've got unbelievable chemistry with this guy. He makes us infinitely better which is true by the way like the Warriors when Draymond's on the floor this season are infinitely better than when he's off the floor and if they don't make the playoffs you will go back to Draymond's suspension as the reason why they didn't that is absolutely the case so I understand people thinking yeah he's finally you know it's caught up to Steph and it's starting to impact him but I also have a hard time to believe that you know, the Warriors are going to say, you know what, that game in Orlando when you got two technical fouls and an ejection, that was the last straw for us. That was the last straw. Like that, I find that hard to believe given what they've been through with Draymond in the past. And so is this the end for Draymond Green at the Warriors? Is this the kind of last hurrah? These are the last nine or 10 games? I absolutely think not. Absolutely. I think Draymond will be back next season unless he does something completely stupid over these last 19 games, gets himself suspended again or something. Like, even he had the the uh, the little, I don't even know what you call it, with Grant Williams today in the third or fourth quarter, which was just was just nothing. As Steve said, post-game, like, if that wasn't Draymond, if that was just another random player, you wouldn't even be asking me about it kind of thing. So, uh, I mean, Draymond could probably go get himself two techs and eject it again at some point, again in the season, and... I don't think it's going to change too much. And obviously that would be a huge disappointment, but I don't know. Like obviously he's wearing thin, but I don't think he's wearing thin enough on Steph and the Warriors for them to draw a line at not a random ejection, like clearly an impactful ejection, but an ejection after two technical fouls for drawing at the refs, you know, that's just, he's going to have to do something else pretty big for that to happen. And uh, I've said it previously, like, if he does something else pretty big, it might not just be a Warrior issue. It might be an NBA issue where the guy's barred from the league or something. Who knows? But uh, anyway, we might finish it up there. I think Draymond will be back on the team this season. But my my biggest question – sorry, next season. Uh, but my biggest question mark going forward certainly is c- continues to be the starting lineup and what Golden State are going to do given JK, this knee issue, seems like it's a short-term thing and he could be back. Uh, against the Spurs, Clay could be back against the Spurs. Well, he was a late scratch in this one after a really good game against the Magic. Uh, and yeah, what are the what's Steve going to do? What's my my bet is Clay will continue to start just because, as I spoke about before, I think this team lacks perimeter shooting beyond him and Clay. I think they need both of them out there to start. Uh, and I think I. I think they'll still want CP and TJD to play a lot together, and therefore I think they'll go back to Wiggins, Kaming, and Draymond. I think that will be the start. So Steph, Clay, Wiggs, Draymond, and sorry, JK, Draymond. That'll be that'll be the starting five, I think, um, for the remainder of the season, if healthy. And there's still some question marks on that with Clay and uh, and JK. That's for sure. Anyway, we'll finish it up there. Looking forward to uh, what Sunday's game against the Spurs or Monday it'll be for me. Another big game for the Warriors. They just, the Spurs win today. Yes, they beat the Knicks. That was a ridiculous game if you go back to that. Uh, yeah, Spurs won 131-26 in OT. Jalen Brunson had 61 points, four rebounds, six assists, and a loss. Wemby goes 40-27 to 
I don't know how Wemby goes the whole game. He puts up 40, 20, and 7, and yet only records one block. That's interesting. But, uh, no, they're, you know, when you got Wemby, we saw, you know, the Warriors have already lost to them earlier, uh, you know, was it earlier this month, I think? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where they were missing Steph and they uh, they were unable to get it done, Golden State. And again, that's another a game. If you if you miss the playoffs, you go back to that one and think, geez, that one really really hurts the chances of of making it. So it's going to be a big game. It's not a guaranteed dub. I don't think anything is a guaranteed dub for the Warriors at this point. But at least they've won three straight in a row now, and they are a significantly better road team than home team. That I think was tonight's win twenty one fifteen now on the season, on the road. So that's pretty impressive. I don't know if that makes you feel better about finishing 10th and having to win two road games to uh, make the playoffs. Who knows? But uh, we've got to try and take some positives here because it's otherwise like, I don't know, I tweeted out today, we're 73 games in. We don't know what the starting best starting five is. And we're in a battle with the Houston Rockets for the 10th seed in the Western Conference. Not fun. Not where this team or fans envisage being at this point, with nine games remaining. But it is what it is. We're here now. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, leave some comments for me. I'm happy to read them out on next episode if you would like. Uh, you can follow me, at POC252. That's P-O-K-252 on Twitter slash, slash X. Follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. Uh, other than that, hope you guys have a great weekend. Cheers.